And for us that are upstairs, we're going to continue on with uh, this morning's uh, sermon and uh, in, in looking at prayer, as I mentioned uh, this morning from the pulpit. So that's kind of going to be the, the topic of conversation here this evening, prayer. And what I would like for us to look at first is, does God hear prayers of anyone and not, not in Jesus? And that's what we're going to look at first. But before we do, for those who are at home uh, who may be watching, uh, we are uh, now going to enter into a Bible study. So if there's you know, men and women uh, asking or answering questions or speaking, that is why. And so we are now entering into a Bible study. Does God hear prayers of anyone not in Jesus? And what, are the, what does the Bible say about these types of things? You know, can we have, do, is there answers to these questions? And I'm here to tell you that there are answers to these questions. Uh, you know, earlier in the, uh, in the, in the morning uh, worship service, I mentioned the fact that uh, God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners. And I know somebody said, oh, but we're all sinners. Yes, we are all sinners. Are there not different categories of sinners? Uh, last time I checked, the answer to that is yes, right? There are different categories of sinners. Those are who are sinned and washed in the blood of Christ, and there are those, bless you, who have sinned and are not washed in the blood of Christ. So there are differences in sinners uh, as, you know, versus those in the body versus those outside of the body. So to be in Jesus is to, is to be what? It's to be in the body of Christ. It's to be a member of the church. It's to be a, a, one of the elect. And so to be in the body of Christ is to have one's sins forgiven because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You guys remember in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it says that Christ purchased the church with his own blood. More specifically, it says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all of the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which what? Which he has purchased with his own blood. So who did he purchase? He purchased the church. And now we have opportunity for the last 2,000 years, everybody has had opportunity to hear the word of God and to uh, decide whether or not you want to become a child of God, if you would want to become a bondservant, a disciple of Christ. And so most of us that are sitting here tonight uh, are, have been baptized, or maybe a few of the, the children that still haven't, but there are, you know, most of us here tonight have been baptized, have been added to the church, and so we know that we're disciples of Jesus Christ. We're washed in his blood. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ that sets us apart. And so if one is not in the church, then the blood of Christ does, doesn't do what? It doesn't wash away their sins. It doesn't cover over their sins. We know that because that's what the Bible literally says. And so Jesus is the savior of his body, we learn in Ephesians 5 and 23. Amen. But to be outside of the body means that uh, one has not had his sins forgiven and thus have not yes, and thus are not yet in a saved state. So there are differences when we, say, when we talk about uh, sinners and hearing the prayers of sinners because there's different categories of sinners. Yes, we are all sinners, uh, but in different, uh, different aspects. So in other words, he is still considered an unforgiven sinner by God for those who are outside of the body of Christ. You could pray to God for forgiveness all day long, but if you're not washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, have you been forgiven of your sins? No. And the answer is no. And the Bible's very clear on that. The only way to receive forgiveness of sins is how? To, baptize. to be baptized. Is that, is, that like our just, is that our opinion? Is that just our thoughts? Or no, is that's what the scriptures teach us, right? We know this, right? I'm not, I'm not giving you anything that's earth-shattering here. But the Bible does tell us clearly that God does not hear the prayers of sinners. For example, in Psalm 66 and verse 18, the scriptures tell us, If I regard the iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. When you look at Psalm 66 and verse 18, and it says, If I regard the iniquity, talking about sin, in my heart, the sin of my mind, the Lord will not hear my petitions. What does it mean, if I regard the iniquity of my heart? What does that mean? Acknowledge it. Cool. Go ahead, Lori. If you... It. You embrace it, you practice it, right? You acknowledge, you acknowledge it. it, you know their sin, but you choose not to turn away from it, right? If I, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, right? Slash pride. Huh? Slash pride. Selfish pride, right? And let's just be honest, some people enjoy their sin. Some people like their sin. They don't want to change. And so does God hear their prayers? And the answer is no. Now, let me, let me clarify, clarify something else. God hears all prayers. And this is kind of like me and Randy were talking about earlier. But there's a difference between hearing the prayer and acting on the prayer. So if he hears the prayer but doesn't act on the prayer, well, 
What's the point then, right? I mean, at, and that's, you know, I, I guess we kind of get into semantics, right, sometimes. Okay, yes, God hears the prayers. Yes, we're all sinners. But there's a difference between unrepentant sinners and repentant sinners. There's a, re there's a difference between the sinners that are in the body of Christ who are continuously washed in the blood of Christ with God, as they have godly sorrow and they turn away from the sin in their lives because repentance isn't a one-time thing. You know how many times people think, there's Christians who think repentance is like that one thing you do at the beginning and then, no, repentance is a lifelong thing. You're always going to be repenting and turning away from sin as you live and as you grow and as you mature. So you look at this, I just wanted to point out Psalm 66, but also Proverbs 28 and 9 says, One who turns away his ears from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination to God. What is that telling us? One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, his prayer is an abomination. What is the Proverbs telling us there? Proverbs 28 and 9. Lewis? Lewis turn? Yeah, okay. Let me say. Sometimes our prayers... Uh, how can you say it? When I can say, uh, you tell a child, now you go over there and tell them you're sorry, mm -hmm. okay? And I don't have any feelings behind that, but I'll say it anyway. Right. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. When we come back to God and we don't really mean it, God said, don't come to me with that because you, you're not behind that statement or that prayer. Yeah. It, it's not a sincerity to it. Yeah. yeah, there's no sincerity to it, that's for sure. And so we also know that Peter quotes from Psalm 34 in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. Let, turn your Bibles over to 1 Peter 3 and 12. And this is a quotation from Psalm 34, 15 and 16. But notice what 1 Peter tells us in chapter 3, verse 12. I'll give you a second to turn there. And I just wanted to kind of point out some things because I, I said this morning that sometimes I believe that just, you know, as elders, ministers, you know, different individuals, if you have conversations with people about sin, sometimes you'll hear, you know, different ideas or thoughts that come up. And are they based in Scripture all the time? And, and the answer is no. And so we need to make sure that our thoughts are based in Scripture, right? Uh, is there scriptural reasons for why we think what we think? And so in 1 Peter 3 and 12, it says, uh, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. Let's define who the righteous are at the beginning of this verse. The eyes, are of, uh, the, eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. Raise your hands. Who, uh, who are the righteous that we're talking about? Judy? The saints. The saints, the saints. right? Uh, uh, more specifically, children, Christians, right? The saved. Right? The saved, right? And those are all right answers. Saints, Christians, saved. It's all, they're all three different uh, words talking about the same group of people. And so, and then it says in the next uh, line, but the face of the Lord is against who? Those who do evil, right? So you look at that, that, that basic verse, right? That simple passage of scripture, and it seems to break it down pretty, uh, pretty simply. You even look over to Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 25 or 26. Let me look. Uh, verse 26. And verse 26, you could kind of make a note in your Bible by 1 Peter 3.12, and you, they could kind of go hand in hand. So while you're turning there, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And we kind of learn a little bit about those who do evil. Who are they? What do they look like? Well, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 tells us. For if we go on sinning willfully. Who is the letter of... Uh, the letter of Hebrews written to? It's written to Jewish converts in the church, right? So is he talking to Christians? So when it says, if we go on sinning, who's we? The Christians. So if Christians go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice even for their sins. But Dave, you just said, though, that, that, uh, that we're all sinners, but there's two different classes of sinners, those in the church and those outside of the church. And you said that the blood of Jesus Christ continuously cleanses us uh, of our sins. But there's something else that I have to tell you about 1 John. It says it continuously cleanses us of our sins for all those who walk in the light. Walk according to God's commands, God's word, his teachings. Remember how I said what is biblical faith? Belief, trust, obedience. Belief, trust, obedience. You, it's all three working in harmony. If you believe but you don't trust, what good is that? If you believe and, and, and you don't trust, you're not going to obviously be obedient because why would you be obedient in something that you don't trust in the first place? So it has to be all three working in harmony. Randy? That verse in 1 John, verses refer to continuing 
to walk in the light. Continuing to walk in the light, yes. Continuing to be faithful and yep. walking in the light. In Absolutely. First John. First John. I'm sorry? John. That, that's first in First John. Yep. First one. Okay, I missed that one. Yep. So when you look at these different passages of Scripture, I'm just trying to show you some of the nuances of it, right? Uh, there are two different, really, classes of sinners, if you will, those inside the church versus those outside the church. But then inside the church, there's those who walk according to the light versus those who are not walking according to the light. There's another passage that you can look to. Flip over, uh, if you're already by Peter. Uh, let's go to 2 Peter and chapter 2. I've got to see what verse it is here. 20. 20. We're going to go 20 through 22. 2 Peter chapter 2, 20 through 22. We're going to look at this. Now, when you get to 2 Peter, I'll give you a second to turn there. Who is uh, Peter speaking to? Christians. He's talking to Christians. So again, he's talking to Christians. This shouldn't be a, that should be the easiest question I ever ask you. You know, like, well, who's Peter talking to in 1 Peter? Uh, who is the writer of Hebrews writing to, right? Who is Paul talking? All of these letters were addressed to Christians, right? To deal with problems that are going on in the church, right? To deal with st uh, different situations that are arising. And so in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse starting in verse 20, notice what it says. <clears throat> For if after they have escaped... Wait a second. Who's they? Christians. Christians. So... For if, after Christians have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and their Savior Jesus Christ, wait, let's pause there. How did you escape the defilements of the world? Baptism. Baptism, right? You gave yourself over to the Lord. You were baptized for the remission of your sins. God added you to the church. He picks you up and he adds you to the kingdom. Notice what it says. For if the Christians, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse than the first. For it would be better for them, Christians, not to even have known the way of righteousness than to have, have in, having known it to turn away from the holy commandment that was handed on to them. It has happened to them, according to the true, true proverb, that a dog returns to his own vomit, a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. So I know we're talking about prayer, but have you ever heard, you know, that the idea of the once saved, always saved? What does this verse do with that? How can you believe in once saved, always saved, and then read that? And then come away thinking, oh, we're good. God's got this, right? No matter what I do, I'm in. There's nothing I could do to lose my salvation. The scriptures would say otherwise. But again, you look at all of these passages in, in regards to the topic tonight, in regards to prayer, we know that even to those who are the elect, I gave you one of the Proverbs, I was talking about the Jews when they were God's elect, right? Those who uh, set aside the commandments of the Lord, but then continued to pray to the Lord, their prayers, their petitions became like an abomination to God. That's what it said in Proverbs. And then we learn here that those Christians, uh, uh, those of us Christians who set aside the commandments of the Lord, want to be Christian, but still, but we continue to uh, live, live as the world, and we continue to, 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 to live as if we're not disciples of Christ, as if the blood of Christ hasn't washed over us. He says, you're like a dog that returned to his own vomit. Like, you know, you're, you're, that, you're that individual who has forgotten who you are. And so you just, I, I love that passage of scripture because it's so vivid, right? And it's disgusting, but that's, that's the point. God says, if you're that Christian who's been washed in the blood of Christ and you revert back to your old ways and become your, your second state has become worse than the first, he says, he goes, you're disgusting to me. You're an abomination to me. So how, how well do you think my prayers and petitions are going to be handled? So when I pray to God, do you think there might be something hindering my prayers? That should be a... Uh, a, a very loud yes and yep. amen on that, right? And so that's it goes back to what we were talking about in the, in the sermon this morning. Randy? You go back to the world, people, the Christians that this happens to, you go back into the world and you deny everything that you once believed in. Yeah. So you have nothing left to save yourself. Yeah. You're denying power of Christ, power of God, salvation through baptism and repentance. Yeah. You're denying all that, turning your back and walking away from it. Yeah, absolutely. Wait, wait, more than, I, I agree, 
more than that. And we, sometimes we, I keep falling back because I have to remind myself. When we start doing that, who did Christ send to carry us through all this? All the things that we need to know. The Holy Spirit. Yeah. How do you think he feels? Happy? Yeah. Joyous? No, he's grieved. Yeah. We have to be very careful. Oh, there's only one way to grieve the Holy Spirit. No. We have to be very careful. Yeah, there's more than one way. Yeah. Because he's God. <laughs> yeah. We have to be very careful how we stretch them. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts or comments on, on this portion of it? Randy? That, that is so true. You've seen it. The ministers have seen it. The members of the lower church have seen the people that leave the church. Very, very difficult to bring them back. Mm-hmm. Satan's covered their heart. Yeah. They've left the church. They make excuse after excuse after excuse. But I think the most difficult part is that part of it is that Satan, this has happened to them, and Satan simply covers their heart, and the truth is difficult to reach them again. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right about that. Go ahead. But is there an opportunity for repentance? I mean, if something like that happens or somebody was, was baptized mm-hmm. and they walk away, yeah. and they come back? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's why when we offer the invitation on Sundays, uh, you know, we give the opportunity for people to come forward, to be restored. You know, if you've been away from the church for a long time and you you haven't been living for Christ and you haven't been living uh, according to God's commands, you haven't been worshiping, you haven't really been doing anything that God has required of you, you know, that's why we offer the invitation for those who wish to be restored, those who wish to give their lives to Christ, you know. And so, you know, absolutely, we could we'll get to you in a second. Uh, you know, absolutely, you could you could be, you repent and be restored. It's God's desire that we repent. It's God's desire uh, that 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 He doesn't lose any of His sons and daughters, right? Because we are all God's children. Uh, Carrie, before you, uh, Lori had her hand up. Well, that's what I started a Bible study at my mom and dad's house, and that's how my aunt Trish she got back to coming because she started going to Bible study. Yeah. She came back in just that way because she yeah. was before she was away for a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lori started a, a Bible study at her parents' house, and that was the one that we did. But we did it for a long time, right? Yeah. And uh, there was two baptisms and a restoration that came out of that Bible study. And, and one of it wasn't a member here. She was a member at Gateway. And she, now she attends faithfully to Gateway. But she came back to the Lord, and it was, you know, having her heart pricked from the scriptures. And now she's faithful over there. And uh, she's, you know, had... Uh, yeah. Jim and Deb, you know what I mean, that were baptized. That was a good Bible study. That was a productive one. Uh, Carrie. Well, I was going to say the prodigal son is a good one. The prodigal son, yes. He was there with his father. But yeah. He went away, but I, he was very accepting of him, just like I believe yeah. he would be accepting of him. And, yeah, and, so, and that's why I love the story about the prodigal son, because who's the father, right? The father's representative of who? God. Of God. And he wants you to repent, right? The brother was ticked off. You never killed any goats or lambs or anything for me to throw a party. And he says, but, I, but everything I have is yours. But he wasn't seeing it, right? He was just seeing uh, because he didn't have the same love and affection as a father has for a son that a brother would have for a brother, right? And so, you know, you know that's, the, that's the desire of any parent to have their children uh, to repent, uh, to turn away from uh, evil and to return back to God. Uh, or to return, or, or to to, uh, to walk away from the, the world in a sense to come back into obedience to even the, the rules of the home, right? Uh, and so, I mean, yeah, that's always the parents, uh, you know, desire. Judy, um, I just have a question. I'm sorry. What was that scripture in um, <clears throat> Psalms 56? Uh, we had Psalm 66, verse 18. Oh, 66. Yeah, okay, 66. Thank you. Thank you. And then Proverbs 28, okay. 9. It was just Proverbs the Psalms. 28, 9. Yep. And then the next one was Psalm was 34, one. I was confused. which is the quotation from First <coughs> Peter. David, uh, just if you turn your Bibles a page here, it may be where you're open, 2 Peter 3, 9. 2 Peter 3, 9. Let's go there. It gives us hope. 2 Peter 3, 9. I'll read that to you. It tells us. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. I mean, that, that, that kind of hits to the heart, you know what I mean, of the, you know, the prodigal son, right? As well as, you know, we were at dinner yesterday, and, and Christy was frustrated, you know, with you know, some of the patience that she had. And, 
And, and, and Leslie, I don't know if it's Leslie here right now, but if Leslie was here, she just knows that, you know, if you're a hospital worker, you know, it's sometimes, uh, sometimes it's just hard to deal with people, right? If you've ever dealt with like retail or the public, whether it's, you know, and, and, and it's, it's just sometimes the hospital's in a whole different setting because of the drug seekers and, and so many other things that they have to deal with. But she was just so frustrated, you know? And we're, we, so we met her for dinner, you know, and because uh, her, her cousin's in town and we were at Bubba's yesterday. And, and she was just saying, I just, don't, I just don't understand how Jesus, you know, just how he just loves us so much, how God just loves us so much. And she knows it's her frustration talking. She knows what the Bible answer is, right? But it's just because of that frustration. But when we get frustrated, we forget that how soon would she quickly forgive Noah or Aiden a trespass? And we have to look at it in the same light. For we are God's children. We are God's offspring. And so how quickly would God forgive any of us if we repent and turn from the sin in our lives? And if they repent and turn from the, 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 the whatever the egregious was or whatever the, the problem was, right, and returned, right? You, they would, you'd be the happiest parents you know, in the world. Did I see a hand somewhere? No? No. Oh, right. Tyler. I'm just going to throw it in there. Yeah, this, I'm really glad you brought up the prodigal son. Because this, uh, this God being our father, he could have presented this architecture in a lot of ways, you know, just the boss, the maker. Yeah. But, but this father, uh, it's not the analogy, but, but this, this rhythm of a parent loving their child, it didn't make too much sense to me when I was Miles' age. But now that I have Miles, it's, yeah. everything you're saying is so true. Like, I could be really upset with, or to the point where I don't, you know, I don't want to interact with, yeah. I don't want to help you, you're so far from me. But the moment that there's a sincere want to make peace or yeah. do do the right thing or do some growing up whose heart would it be open to that yeah it's it's quite an analogy and you'd be willing to do anything yeah right? just about anything for, for your children <laughs> right yeah there's limits but you know right Remember that, Mom. <laughs> and let's just be honest if you're a parent there are some limits right but 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 with god there's limits too right so go ahead lewis when we sin i might i might curse you out I gotta make up with you, but my sin really isn't with you. My sin is with God. Yeah. I gotta repent to God and say, God, because He says you sin against God. David said that every time. He said, you know, I didn't sin against. I sinned against you first. And yeah. We gotta get that straight first. If we realize that we sin against God first, all these other things that we, we can ask for repentance everywhere else. Absolutely. Absolutely. It separates us from God. Mm -hmm. Sin separates. Sin separates us, us, oh, us from yeah. God. So at the end of the day, we look at we look we go a little bit further. Someone may ask the question: Doesn't God hear the prayers of sinners who want to be saved? Okay, so remember we got two different groups. We got the saved and the, and the not saved, right? We got the unrepentant sinners versus repentant sinners. And so, doesn't God hear the prayer of sinners who want to be saved? Well, first, God knows all the thoughts of mankind, does He not? I mean, isn't that very clear in Scripture? Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds, uh, according to the desires of his heart. God knows all things, right? There's nothing that, that, that escapes his knowledge. And God, he, but the point, though, is that God wants all men to be saved. We looked at 2 Peter 3, 9 a moment ago, and thus will providentially help that man and that woman who desires a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, to be able to come to the knowledge of the truth, right? Think about it in Acts chapter 17, verse 27. Acts 17, 27, it tells us that they would seek, that he, that he hopes that they would seek God and perhaps they might grope for God and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So you think about that verse there, right? And even if I went back a couple of verses uh, prior to that and looked at it, and you start in, say, verse 26. Uh, Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 26 uh, through, and 27. And he made from one nation, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times, their boundaries, their habitation, and that they would, that they would seek God if perhaps he might grope for him to find him, though he, might, uh, they, though he is not far from each one of us. So you look at this providentially, God has made himself known to his creation. Isn't that what it tells us in Romans chapter 1, you know, verses 18 and following? God says that we are without excuse. He has made himself known to his creation. And God gives us every opportunity to come to Christ. But isn't that why we're constantly talking about the urgency? You know what I mean? 
I, I can tell you, I've talked with people, I've preached to people, I've done Bible studies with people, you know, whether it's in the building or outside the building, people, some, some of them know the truth, they've heard the truth, but yet they still haven't made that decision to go all in. They still haven't made that decision to give their life to Christ. There's, there's a limitation. There's going to become a time to where God says you had the opportunity. And so we need to, we need to make sure that we are willing to do all we can uh, to, to, to be obedient to, to the gospel. Mike? I think what you said describes Saul. God yeah. seen Saul's heart, even though he was killing his Christians. He seen like he, his heart that he was actually thinking he was doing what God wanted. And yep. made himself known to Saul. Yeah. But those three days he was blinded is what we're talking about. Yep. He That's was fasting, prayers, he was praying. He was praying. That's when God listens to your prayers. Yeah. He's helping formulate in your heart, what you need to do. And yeah. that's what God gave him an ch- opportunity to do. Yep. Ready? Stephen Covey wrote a book 20, 25 years ago called The, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. In one of those chapters, he talks about how to live your life. And he says, live your life with the end in mind. Yep. And most people don't do that. Yeah. You have, I've had conversations with people about coming to the Lord and you know, you're going to die and you, you're lost when you die. And, they, and their answer is, well, if I die. Mm-hmm. People don't look at it seriously. Yep. They don't look at the end. They don't want to think about the end. Well, I, I, know, I know some family members right now, not uh, necessarily media family, but just I know of some family that, you know, there was, there was some uh, problems between <coughs> siblings, right? And they almost swore off because of, you know, things that happened many years ago. And they just swore off really even wanting to see each other, deal with each other, talk to one another. And, well, long story short, one of them's dealing with some health issues. One of them's, you know, up there getting a little bit up there in age. He's 78. He's got cancer. He's got some other health issues. Now, all of a sudden, there's this, the heart starts to soften a little bit, right? Because people start to think of things and look at things a little bit differently when death may be knocking on the door, when, uh, when, when we're, we're creeping up there in age, right, and, and our health starts to fail, all of a sudden we start, to, we start to think about the end. We start to think about what's next. We start to think about the teachings of God and the teachings in the scriptures, right? And then all of a sudden it starts to soften your heart a little bit, right? Now, there are some people who will go to the grave. I refuse, you know. But there are a lot of people in times of, uh, of sickness and, and death and war and famine that all of a sudden they start searching for God. They start searching for answers. They start being more willing to, to, to listen and to forgive. I mean, the Bible's crystal clear. You don't forgive others. God's not forgiving you. You are going to say something, Roxanne? Yeah. I, it makes me think of when you talk to people sometime and you said they enjoy their sin. Yeah. And I always say, well, the flesh is weak, and God knows the flesh is weak. <coughs> yep. And so, you know, they think, oh, I don't know if I want to give this, this, and this up. But they're not looking at what they're going to get. They're just yeah. looking at what they're going to give up. And I think a lot of it could be stubborn. They're stubborn. Oh, yeah. You know, but maybe when something hits heavy, like you said, when they all of a sudden get sick, yep. or they have an illness, it's like, oh, wait a minute, I better think about that. Yeah, for right? sure. You know, I was going over my notes, and I, and I reading different things that different people uh, have wrote, commentaries and things. And this one individual said, there is no barrier between the child of God and God, but there is a barrier between the sinner and God. And he says, what do I mean by that? There is no barrier between the child of God and God, but there is a barrier between the sinner, the unrepentant sinner and God. What does he mean by that? Judy? Um, The sin is the barrier. Yep. Isn't the sin the barrier? And when we become a child of God and we're working at not sinning yep. and praying and communicating with him and studying, then the barrier is he Amen. overlooks that. Yep, that's true. Stephen? We choose between uh, masters. Yeah. Good and evil. Yeah. Can't serve two masters, right? Right. But the good news is the master is already chosen us. Many men are already called us. Yeah. You know what the difference between those who are in the body and those who are outside the body are? God does not provide for non-Christians in a special way, but he does in a general way. But if there are special privileges to being in the body of Christ, 
that those who are outside of the body of Christ will never be able to receive. And that's the spiritual blessings that are only in found in Christ Jesus. Jesus said that God sends his sunshine on the evil and the good. He sends his rains on the just and the unjust. Have you ever seen somebody who lives a worldly life? But man, they seem to have it all. You know, they got a good job, they got a good career, they got a good house, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, they got a good family, they got all these. You would think that, man, they're blessed in so many ways. But are they blessed by God or are they just basically taking advantage of whatever opportunities have, been, have come their way, right? But it's not a blessing from God because God gives all of us, in a general sense, all the same blessings. What we do with those blessings now, right, is, is really comes down to us. God can, provide, God can providentially uh, work through our lives, and we know that. But we know that when you look at those who you know are worldly, worldly individuals who have nothing to do with religion or theology, or more ag agnostic or even atheistic, you know, but they seem to be blessed. Is it an actual blessing, or is that just a generic word that we like to use now, right? We use it in the generic sense. It's not a blessing from God. It's not spiritual blessings. They're just earthly blessings because you have taken, in the general sense, what God gives to all his creation, and you make the most of it. But oftentimes people look at them and say, God has blessed them. No, God has not blessed them. And so we can look at that as you, as you look at some more scriptures. God provides fruitful seasons from which humans gain food and gladness, we learn in Acts 14. In a general sense, it sometimes appears, as I was just saying, that God is answering the prayers of specific sinners. But he is not becoming, he is not because he is not treating them any differently than he treats anyone else. For example, even those who don't pray receive these physical blessings in a general sense, do they not? If, if you don't pray, you're not religious, you have a zero relationship with God, do they not receive the, uh, the sunshine and the early rains? Do they not receive the fruitful seasons, right? Uh, just like all of us uh, receive and take advantage of. So God is the source of all blessings in a general sense, but they are not given in response to prayers to sinners. So there's a difference between what somebody appears to have versus what is an actual blessing from God. And sometimes I think we can use them sometimes in a, in a generic sense. Judy? And, and these, oh, I really appreciate that point, um, as many, um, are earthly, are just earthly uh, blessing. I mean, they're just uh, on this earth. Yep. They're blessings of this earth, but they don't have the blessing that we have daily of the promise of heaven. Yeah, the promise, the hope that's set which, before us. Which is, yes, which is a huge difference. Pat? Um, who says um, material wealth or having anything that we're calling, I think we're we're talking about those things right now, calling those blessings. Who says those are blessings? Mm -hmm. People yeah. use the word in a generic sense all the time, not in a religious sense. Yeah, but even yep. if it's something that's yeah. beneficial to you here on this earth, yep. who says that's a blessing? Yeah. Who says well, that's drawing you closer to God? Who's yeah. saying that's not something that you need to overcome? Yeah. Who's saying that's not something God's saying to you, I need you to deal with this mm -hmm. and find me through this, not me saying, oh, I'm blessing you, giving you this because you've done so well yeah. as an answer to anything. Yeah, Tyler? Right. Oh, well, I didn't know where Pat was going. I thought I had a territory. Uh, no, well, he was saying, who's saying all this stuff? I wanted to think about the book of Job, where he had all that stuff, and then he didn't have all that stuff. And I, like, oh, man, it must have been something with you and the guy upstairs yeah. gone awry. Yep. But that was, but then you took a but turn like, at the end. It's kind of like with certain things like medications or something like that. There's a med some medications I may take, they may help me. Yeah. But if I give it to you, it but, may kill you. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And I know your I mean, point, but people will then say, oh, because it helped you. They will say generically, oh, that was a blessing, right? Or if somebody, you know, somebody is healed through God's providence and God uses providentially through the medical system, through technology, through pharmaceuticals, uh, through all these different uh, 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 surgical type procedures, right? And they say, and then somebody, you know, their, hands, their cancer is, they're healed from their cancer. And they say it's a miracle, right? But you, people throw around blessings and miracles and these types of words all the time. But, and that's what I say, it's so much so that they really have no meaning anymore. And that's why we have, when we talk about miracles, we have to talk about it in the sense of outside of the laws of nature. And that's why when we talk about blessings, we say, okay, well, what really is a blessing then, right? And so we know that in Christ, we have the nine spiritual blessings that, that we learned about in scripture. 
But outside of that, I mean, I just think in society, you hear the word blessing used pretty often. Let Randy and then well, we'll go back to you. I think part of that is people do have some concept of God. And, they, and when good things happen to them, they want to believe it's coming from yeah. God. And they use the word blessing. Yeah. We have a good example of that this week. Pat Robertson passed away. Now, here's a man that built a career. Yeah. He was blessed. Yeah. He was blessed by everybody that watched his TV show and sent him money. Yep. And he felt in his heart that he was blessed by God. Yep. He didn't preach the truth, but he felt sincerely, as Paul did mm -hmm. when he persecuted Christians, I do believe, yep. he felt sincerely that he was blessed by God. Yeah, so you can look at you can look at Brother Robertson, you can look at Brother Graham, right? You can look at a bunch of those different ones who feel that they were blessed by God, and in fact, where they were just blessed, uh, they were blessed because of the false teachings and, and, the, and the ministries that came from those things and all the money that poured in, which is just just hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that these people received over, over time. So, but again, they would tell you that they were blessings, right? Uh, so, but again, it's just how we use the word. Carrie? Yeah, how we'll use it. I mean, you look at the the the, the parable, or was it the parable, the story of the the, the rich man who uh, tore down his uh, his barns and tore down his storehouses and then built bigger ones, right? And he says, "Man, now I got enough food and and ale and different things to store it up to last me the rest of my life." And God says, "You fool!" He thought he was blessed. I guarantee you, he thought he was blessed. God says, "I'm going to take it from you tonight. I'm going to take your life. Now, who's going to have what you have?" Ruth. How about Cornelius, who was so well thought of and and uh, materially blessed and had everything, and he gave and he prayed and everything, and uh, and uh, Acts ten three was uh, what is it, Lord? So he said that your prayers and your alms have come up to a, as a memorial before yeah. me. And yeah, absolutely. Had Peter go and preach more correctly. Yeah, and I, I look at you know his alms were God working providentially. The alms that he offered up to the Jews, I could you could say were used providentially through uh, in order to, to bring uh, ease and comfort to those Jews that those Jews who were struggling, because most commentators and historians believe that he was a proselyte of the gate. He wasn't just a general. Uh, um, just a common Gentile, if you will. Uh, he was a proselyte of the gate, which means that he didn't uh, hold into the whole law, but he was upholding uh, into certain aspects of the law. And then, so it would have gave him certain privileges and the Jews were happy with those privileges. We need to learn which is more important, the earthly blessing or the spiritual blessing. Yeah, amen. The earthly blessing or the spiritual blessing, which would be more important? Oh, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Cornelius? Yeah. Well, he was baptized. After. After. Yeah. yeah, after. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. a Christian. So God heard his prayers. Yep. Um, it said that he prayed regularly, and Peter was sent to him so that God, so would you say that God hears the prayers of those who are seeking him, or, yeah. or he was a righteous well, person? At that time, yes, he wasn't in the Lord yet, but he was a proselyte of the gate, and that's why most many of the people believe that when he was, he was still praying to Jehovah God, uh, he was worshiping God, but he didn't have the full privileges of all the Jews uh, being a Gentile. God heard his prayers. They came up, it says, as a memorial before him. And so, but God heard his prayers as somebody who was faithful to God and faithful to God for a long time and doing a lot of good works in the name of God, praying unto God. Charles? It's what you're praying for. What you're praying for? Yeah. See, yeah. I'm praying for the right thing. Yeah. Scriptures that say, seek and you will find. Knock, the door will be open. Yeah, yeah. That's Cornelius' approach. He was, doing, he was seeking. 
and God is listening to every, he listens yeah. to everything. He's not saying he's going to answer everything. Yeah. But when people who are focused in on trying to find God, he's going to open the door for them. Mm -hmm. That's why Peter had to come 30 miles or whatever it was to come preach to him and his family. And yeah. God said, I'll find a way for you to get there. And so not that his prayers weren't being answered. His prayers probably weren't being answered in the sense that he does for Christians. Yeah. But he knows that Cornelius was seeking him. And he, we, as long as we're knocking at the door yeah. and sincerely seeking him until we take our last breath, God is going to find a way for us to get there. And in Judaism, he was an active member, you know what I mean, active participant, uh, and, and blessed many people uh, because of his wealth and his riches, you know, but basically he was blessing others with what God had already blessed him with. So he had a full, he had a good understanding of, of who Jehovah God was already, uh, being a proselyte. Okay. Um, two, two things, I think of um, the eunuch. The, yeah, the Ethiopian eunuch, which is another proselyte of the gate. Yeah. In that regard, he is hearing their prayers. Yeah, he does hear their prayers, and that's the key: is God will providentially work through you know, through different individuals and different entities to bring you to Christ. I believe that God used Joel Olstein to bring me to Christ. And people say Joel Olstein. Hey, I'm just telling you. When I got mad at the Catholic Church and and, and with all the the sexual abuse of all these kids, I, I to me that was the church. I didn't know any better. I never even heard of the Church of Christ really at that point. And so, you know, I didn't really know anything about it. So I, I stopped going to church. I said, if that's, what, if that's what religion is, I want nothing to do with it. So for two years, I sat around drinking and watching football. And that's what I was doing. And every Sunday morning, I'm waiting for the pregame shows to come on. Well, guess what's on Sunday mornings before the pregame? <laughs> Joe Osteen. Osteen and a host of other ones. Well, so I'd just be laying. There's nothing on, literally, Sunday mornings. I just, well, let's see what, see what Osteen has to say today, you know? And he gave some good speeches, right? I mean, you know, it, it, at the time, I thought it was, you know, he was pretty religious because I didn't really know what the Bible taught at the time. But all of a sudden, I watched him enough, and all of a sudden, he came to Auburn Hills, and he put on one of his big productions. Me, and, uh, Christy, and my brother Jeff, and his wife, we went out to Auburn Hills. We paid the money to see, put on a good show, and he gave a good message. And, you know, you're all pumped up and wanted to buy all his books when you left. And, but, what, but what was the point, right? It was me watching him a false teacher, but somebody who was still preaching some truth, who wasn't completely all uh, off the rails. And I remember waking up, I remember one Sunday, I said, I told Christy, or one Saturday, I said, you know, I need to get back to church. I said, Obviously, I'm not going back to that Catholic church. I said, I said, what was the name of that church you said that you guys, you kind of grew up in, you know, part time? And she said, Church of Christ. So I remember in sales, I said, oh, I've seen a few of those around town. And that's what started my journey. Well, thanks, Joel. Right, but I'm not gonna lie. It, I was watching him, and it reminded me of my love for Christ. He reminded me of my love for Christ, which then <coughs> said, "I need to get back into church." I know I'm not going to the Catholic church, so then I started looking, and then I never even heard of the really the Church of Christ. So God could use different people in different ways to bring somebody to Christ, and so that's why sometimes you know what I mean. We have to be careful. You know what I mean? Uh, but you know. You know, I would venture to say we all probably have different testimonies, different stories that we could probably tell about how we found Christ, how we came to the knowledge of the truth, who God used providentially, right? And I believe that God providentially used him, you know what I mean, to, to bring me to the Lord's church. And back then, I wasn't thinking about becoming a preacher. Yeah. Now, when I was younger, I wanted to be a priest, but I kind of liked the ladies, I ain't going to lie. Yeah. And I said, well, that, that's not mine, that's not for me. <laughs> And, but then I realized, oh, you can get married? And then Christy says, I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> it was a whole power struggle there for a minute. Go ahead. I was thinking, and the, a little bit humorous side is, it was a Catholic priest who held the psalm, yeah. going from Islam to Christianity. Yeah. That's what, it's so interesting to hear that story. Yeah, absolutely. So there are different people, and different, God could use different people to bring about his will. And, and so we just have to be open to those things. I know we're, we're like five minutes past time, so any uh, last minute uh, questions or comments? As long as we are preaching the gospel, we are. Right. <laughs> so it was a good conversation tonight, Pat. Um, I think a little bit what some people were saying about whether or not God hears the prayers of those who are outside of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at that verse we read this morning, you mentioned it in John 9, 31. If you read the whole thing, you see that. 
that God, yeah, there's a separation between sinners and mm -hmm. God. For those who, kind of like you were talking about last week, that category of sinners that, you know what, I'm good with my sin and I don't want to, yep. I'm not looking at, and God said, all right, then there's a separation mm -hmm. between us. Yep. But for those who are seeking him, yep. those who respect him and, and are earnestly trying to do what he says, yep. even if you're outside, God's going to hear you. Yep. God's going to respond to you. God will hear, but he'll also put people in your path to help you to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, will your heart be open enough to recognize those doors that are being opened? You know what I mean? That's the question where it comes down to. Some people are, some people aren't. And so, but it's just no, it's no different than any temptation. There's no temptation that can over, that can overtake you where God will not uh, uh, provide you a way of escape. All right? And maybe I should have explained it. I'm not saying that God will hear your prayers for a new car. Yeah, yeah. Well, God will hear your prayers and yeah. seeking oh, things. <laughs> yeah. But I think, but yeah, I, I think that's kind of like a big part of it is how often, you know, when people pray, they pray for the physical and not the spiritual. You know, when God makes some of those promises, you know what I mean? You know, when Jesus says, "Ask unto the Father, and, and, and it'll be re, it'll be granted," He was talking about kingdom things. He was talking about the spirit. He was talking about. Uh, you know, things that have to do with the building up of your faith and your in the church. He wasn't talking about a nicer house and a nicer car and you know a, a, a stronger 401k or a better president. You know. <laughs> well, that's the uh, that's the gospel that's preached by way too many people in the denominational world. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. All right, guys. Lewis, you want to have uh, have a closing prayer, and then we'll be finished. Dear God, once again, uh, your children have uh, sat at your knee and listen to your word and open our hearts and our minds to what you would have us to understand. Our time of ignorance of what and how you react to us as, as your, uh, your creation is being opened up more and more. I pray to God that we are sensitive to those who are outside of, the, outside of your word and outside of the kingdom. And our first prayer should always be that we should go out and seek them and bring them in. And we pray to God that you'll give us the courage continue to study your word, to be in the assembly, so we can grow in love and appreciate each other's comforts, and always be a productive person in your kingdom. As always, to God, we ask you to forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody.